interesante en que continuará un poco la, eh, el comentario acerca del, del performance y el, eh, la relación del artista con la historia, con su autoconciencia histórica. Con nosotros eh, está eh, Roger Berger, que es organizador de exposiciones y autor. Eh, ha curado varias exposiciones eh, eh, con, en este, la Fundación General en Viena, en el Arte Gessner Gesellschaft en Hannover y en el Central Home of Artists en Moscú. Actualmente, él es eh, el, el director de la siguiente documenta. Eh, Alison Gingeras, eh, a, también es, que está aquí a mi derecha, ha, ha trabajado para el Pompidou y para el Museo Guggenheim. Ha, ha escrito bastante sobre el, el tema recientemente del artista eh, y, y, y el performance y su autoconciencia como personaje dentro de la historia del arte, que es un tema que estamos tratando ahora. Ha escrito sobre la obra de Daniel Bioen eh, y, y trabajado en exposiciones relacionadas a él, así como muchas otras exposiciones de arte contemporáneo. Y Alexander Alberro, que, que también se nos une hoy, este, gran historiador y es, escritor de, sobre el arte conceptual y eh, arte que desde la década de los 60 hasta ahora, uh, ha escrito sobre Dan Graham, eh, ha escrito varios ensayos críticos sobre el arte conceptual y recientemente sobre la obra de Andrea Fraser, que también va a, a presentar hoy. Entonces comenzaremos con, eh, con Roger, que nos uh, hará una breve ponencia y cuando terminemos nuestras ponencias, eh, finalmente entraremos al diálogo. Por favor. Thank you, <clears throat> Pablo Aguera and Citac for bringing me to Mexico. It's quite exciting, um, to be honest, to, to be able to address such a large and also young audience. I will approach the relation between the historical <clears throat> and the imaginary not from a theoretical perspective or from an artistic perspective, but rather from a perspective of someone who is making exhibitions. And I will try to show how exhibitions can function as uh, modes to connect historical data, for example, but also different realms of action, be they probably called historical or, or present. What you can see <clears throat> on my first image is an old smokestack in Poblano, the former textile quarter of Barcelona. In the 19th century, the textile industry was a driving force behind the city's progress, and Barcelona was rightly called the Manchester of the Mediterranean. This smokestack also served as one of the last bastions of the Republican troops in the Spanish Civil War. From the small balustrade and the tiny windows, the Republicans and anarchists shot down on the fascist troops, which had already entered and occupied the city except for the textile quarter, where resistance was strongest. But the people on that smokestack must have realized at some point that they would never had a chance to leave it alive. If you take a closer look at that smokestack, you will see a circular shape. This is a clock which long time ago has passed out of existence. Who knows 
if that clock ended its life in the final battle of the Civil War? In its circular shape, it looks like a target. So maybe it shared the fate of a target? In one of his famous theses about the philosophy of history, Walter Benjamin tells about an extraordinary event during the revolutionary uprisings in Paris. Spontaneously, that is, without any prior agreement, the revolutionaries were shooting at the clock towers in order to stop time. Benjamin analyzed this willful act as the attempt to break the continuum of history, to make time stand still in order to clear the situation for something else to happen, something he also referred to as the true state of exception. The dead clock on that smokestack in Barcelona's textile quarter can be animated, brought back into life by narratives like the one I just came up with, or by forging historical correspondences like the one with Benjamin's clock towers in Paris. But what happens if the clock disappears And the clock is disappearing, for the textile quarter is being radically transformed into what looks like a new city. In this case, in contemporary Barcelona, the act of demolishing historical references serves a wider political agenda. The Civil War left a country divided, and those divisions and their traumatic effects still haunt today's consumer society. So, the political vision is quite simply to get rid of all the references pointing back to historical trauma instead of working through what, after all, is a collective past, people are given the opportunity to connect in a world without any depth. Interestingly, the most obvious emblem of that reality without depth is transparency. Transparency governs the kind of architecture that replaces the historical quarter. But transparency is also the slogan for a kind of democratic governance that is ready to negotiate almost everything, except, of course, capitalist relationality as the ground and principle of sociality, the very ground and principle, by the way, that had been contested by the anarchists. In a strange sense, then, Benjamin was right in associating the broken clock with the rupture of the continuum of history. Transparency is a static concept. It adheres to an aesthetic of death. What can be done about the annihilation of memory to phrase that question uh, in a little broader sense? How do we want to be governed? 
That last question served as a title of an exhibition in Barcelona that was organized by the Museo d'Art Contemporanea. Paradoxically, this museum itself is an effect of that kind of city policy I was just talking about. It was built in the mid-90s by Richard Meyer, an empty modernist gesture that replaced a huge segment of the, of the Raral, another quarter that played an important role during and in the aftermath of the Civil War. It provided shelter for those in need and was in its chaotic structure almost beyond the reach of the police. But precisely because the museum building is widely associated with that kind of city policy whose aim is to neutralize the past, it was impossible to make that exhibition inside that building. Como queremos ser gobernados? Two or three things have to be said about the particular notion of government we are working with. In pre-modern times, government had a much broader meaning than nowadays, where it refers to the rulers of any country and is associated with particular people. The notion of government we were using in the exhibition defines the exercise of power as a way in which certain actions mm -hmm. modify other actions. To quote Michel Foucault, who started to elaborate on that concept in the years before he died, what defines a relationship of power is that it is a mode of action which does not act directly and immediately on others. Instead, it acts upon their actions, an action upon an action, on existing actions or on those which may arise in the present or the future." End of quote. What is important here is a certain play between actions and actions. Government, in the Foucauldian sense, is not simply cause and effect or brute determination. It allows for a certain element of freedom that is part of the process of the transfer between one action and another action. Let me give you an example. In 1967, the Argentinian artist Graciela Carnevale had a gallery exhibition in Buenos Aires. People came to that space where there was nothing on display. But when the room was packed with people, the artist left it and locked the door from outside. The people were suddenly confronted with an uneasy choice. They could decide to stay inside and wait until the bad joke ended. Or they could decide to smash the huge street window. Finally, the glass was broken by someone outside, a photographer, who then took pictures of the people climbing through the broken pane. <laughs> this is a rather spectacular example not only for government, but also for the kind of uses that can be made of an exhibition. For Graciela Carnevale and her, um, <clears throat> and her colleagues at that time, it was also a final gesture. At around the same time, they 
simply left the institutional framework of art in order to make their actions felt in society. They went to the Argentinian province of Tucumán, where the government had privatized the sugar mills and thereby created an incredible misery among the peasant and workers. The first step of the group of artists was to give something like a documentary account of the actual condition in order to counter the propaganda of the government. But the artists also realized that something more was needed, something that would correspond with their own political desire as well as their wish or interest to probe the limits of artistic means of representation. So they started to make interviews with the people, with workers or trade unionists, and elaborated their own modes of sociological analysis. This is a piece which was shown at the exhibition. It's a diagram which points out to the, um, <clears throat> to the different um, agents, uh, banks, corporations, and so on, uh, which were, um, which were um, important, uh, which were important actors in the in that particular situation. It's an aesthetic which might remind you if you know this group of Bureau d'Etude, for example. But um, 30 years earlier. With that knowledge, that kind of knowledge, they embarked on a counter-information campaign that confronted the official propaganda. The medium they were using to communicate that kind of material was again the medium of the exhibition. And what's interesting here is <clears throat> that, um, that often uh, uh, this exhibition is talked about as a kind of so uh, sociological display and the, the aesthetic subtleties get lost. But what's interesting is that also uh, that the, the, the artists worked quite consciously in, uh, uh, in aesthetic terms. For example, this entrance situation was something that was very familiar to um, to the workers of the um, of the uh, of the sugar mills. It was actually a more or less direct copy of the uh, of the working situation itself. So this is also a, an example of the kind of correspondences I mentioned earlier when I quoted Benjamin and the revolutionaries shooting on the clocks in relation to the to the uh, clock on that smoke screen in um, <clears throat> in Barcelona and I will show you an image which points to uh, to the to those correspondences of the actual working situation in uh, <clears throat> in the sugar mills so you get it's obvious okay Those artists made two exhibitions, one in Rosario, the other in Buenos Aires, in the headquarters of the trade union. Those exhibitions, they were they called the first biennial of avant-garde art, which is also interesting that they used the, um, <clears throat> this very precarious cover of autonomous art in order to hide their political activities. It has also to be added that uh, the exhibition in Buenos Aires had to be closed after, um, after five days. The historical example of Tucumán Arde served as a kind of enabling myth for the government exhibition in Barcelona.
Those are documentary photographs from the Archivo in the Barcelona exhibition. Mm -hmm. Here you have the room, or one of the rooms in Barcelona. The experience of Tucumán Arde helped us to shatter the false transparency of the facade of the Magda building and at least to attempt to use the exhibition as a medium that works like a form of organization. So we used <clears throat> three spaces in Barcelona, in this Poblino quarter, which is at the moment transformed into this kind of postmodern um, neighborhood I, uh, I, I showed to you. Three emblematic spaces. The first one, a school building, or rather the gym of a school building, but it's a particular school because it also serves as a meeting point for neighborhood groups and social movements. The second space, um, a former textile factory, Palo Alto, which is now being transformed in, into a complex uh, that houses um, information technologies and uh, offices for architects and so on. It's inside the room. And the third space is a community center, which was built by Enrique Miralles in the late, uh, in the late 80s, but, um, <clears throat> but left empty because the neighborhood is considered to be too problematic. That was the most interesting space, in a way, at least in terms of, of architecture and history, because it quoted the architecture of, of Melnikov. So you, what you had here was a whole promise, the whole unfulfilled promise of modernism. Do we have still some, some time? Or? You can just wrap up. Okay. Uh, what I want to do now is just in the last three minutes I have to go through the exhibition um, in order to give you an idea of the particular work that was shown there and also to at least to hint at how the notion of correspondence was <clears throat> important on one level to connect the artworks and on another level to connect the public with the artworks and also with the subjects the artworks are dealing with. I will make the references very loosely. It's more, uh, more a comic strip. This piece by, um, by Alejandra Riera, which you have on the screen, um, deals with the, uh, with the notion of the border between Argentina and, um, and Bolivia. And what's important is that you have on this photograph of Tucumán Arde, of this campaign in the headquarters of the trade union, all this kind of information material, also slide projectors and so on. So what you had here is also a projector of a particular film of, of Alejandro Riera. For, at, for us it was important to um, actually to, um, to, to to destroy the documentary's pastness by using particular forms or devices, I mean like this, like this machine, and to, to create a continuum, so to speak, between the historical experience of Tucumán Arde and the actual experience for the viewer of being inside that room. The notion of border was also important in relation to this painting installation by Dirk Schmidt. What you have here on this right, on this right hand side is, um, <clears throat> sorry, is a situation uh, 
of two paintings which now hang in the Louvre. One is the Liberty on the Barricades by, um, <coughs> by Eugène, Eugène de la Croix, and the other is the Raft of the Medusa by, um, <coughs> by Giricot. And uh, Schmidt is a painter who is interested in, uh, in, in rescuing the investment of history painting for contemporary purposes. It has to be said that the painting of Delacroix is an idealized version of a, of a singular revolutionary moment. It shows this allegory, this woman on the barricades with the tricolor in, in her hand. The Giricot, on the other hand, is a meticulous, um, <clears throat> almost documentary um, representation of a disaster that happened and which was treated, or which can be treated like a symptom for the corruption of the, of the government of, of Napoleon III. That, that's the reason why this painting was displaced when it was presented in the Salon. The subject Schmidt is dealing with, and that refers again to the problematic of the border, is of a ship, of one of those countless refugee ships which had been um, sunk probably by the Australian army on its trip from Indonesia to Australia. Of that ship, no one survived. So you have you have no witness account of what really happened, and also the uh, scandalous um, <coughs> presence of the Australian army uh, at that event remains somehow hidden. That makes it very difficult for a documentarist of the present uh, to create or to recreate an event if there's nothing left, so to speak. For that reason, Schmidt has no other choice but refer back to the, to the model of de la Croix, that is to deliver an idealized version of an historical event while at the same time, and for both ethical and aesthetic reasons, he would prefer to cling to the model of Jericho. Um, George, we have to. Okay. Move on. So I could. Yeah. You you can imagine that I could go on for hours, but um, <laughs> alone for the sake of my artist. But I. Um, we can we can continue discussing the exhibition if you want in that in the discussion. Okay, afterward. great. So thank you very much. <laughs> I would like to thank Pablo for the invitation to come to Mexico City as well as the organizers of CTAC. I'm going to try and present a synthesis of two papers or several papers that I've been writing over the last year. The first is entitled The Lives of the Artist and the second is entitled The Worst of Warhol. So, flamboyant, extravagant, extroverted, reclusive, eccentric, megalomaniac, alcoholic, sexually obsessed, manic depressive, bohemian. There are as many stereotypes as there are anecdotes about famous artists. The, inev the inevitable entwinement of a colorful biography with an aura of artistic genius cannot elude the hungry reach of public consumption. Tales around artists' lives have provided fodder, fodder for scholarly speculation, populist fascination, as well as plain old, good, good old-fashioned entertainment. Besides the obvious temptations to indulge in simple biography, what importance does persona play in the understanding of an artist's practice? Since the inception of the discipline, art historians have been troubled by the question of artistic persona. For many, the artist's persona is like a pesky shrew that is best chased away so as not to impede the historian or critic's serious quest for facts, formal analysis, and objective interpretation. Thank you. Yet this antagonistic shrew has been an integral part of art history, beginning with its foundational texts. 
The Lives of the Artists, written by 16th century historian and artist himself, Giorgio Vasari, is considered the first proper art historical treatise. Required, required reading for all first year students of art history, Vasari's Lives of the Artists freely blended aesthetic theory, sociological description, fact, fiction, and fable. 500 years after Vasari's death, art history has become, a, has become a much more astringent field of endeavor. By dismissing Vasari's factual errors and exaggerations, the current academic norm continues to discredit one of his main contributions to the field. The notion that legend and myth, as they are generated by the artists themselves, are somewhat inseparable from an understanding of their art practices. This antagonism does not belong solely to art history. Society has often struggled with how to compartmentalize artists and their personas. As an inverted barometer for societal values, artists can safely act out fantasies, break the taboos, and enjoy the indulgences that are shunned by the moral consensus. The notion of bohemianism as it was invented in 19th century France provided an efficient means to prevent artists from contaminating the rest of normative society. To take a few examples from contemporary culture, from the image of the young struggling artist in an unheated loft in Williamsburg in New York, to the DJ cum painter spinning in an electro clash club in former East Berlin, the bohemian imaginary persists in shaping the contemporary expectations of what roles artists should play in society. Yet not all artists continue to take refuge in bohemian or countercultural ideals. Much of Western society has been affected by the ideology of social mobility afforded by American-style capitalism. The compulsion to gain wealth and the obsession with celebrity are the hallmarks of this hegemony, and artists are not immune from them. The absorption of avant-garde strategies into mainstream culture has, been, has made it virtually impossible to use certain historical models based in negation, contestatorial po politics, or oppositional strategies as a means to resist the culture industry and the society of the spectacle as they've been engendered by advanced capitalism. So to make a leap, if the strategies of the avant-garde are somewhat obsolete, their great achievements for sale, and the meanings purged of their original critical intentions, what is left at the artist's disposal? How then can artists resist the cultural industry? Should they resist? Are they passive victims or active proponents of this industry? What position should artists occupy in this kind of society? More than just a collection of artists who have singular personalities or colorful biographies, it is perhaps possible to trace a lineage of artists who have consciously cultivated their public personas as a strategic, often antagonistic element in their art practice. The artists that might fall into this category are quite large. There are some prototype figures such as Picabia, Salvador Dali, and more of concern to me today, Andy Warhol, Jeff Koons, Richard Prince, Martin Kippenberger, and Maurizio Catalan, to name just a few. All of these artists have found ways to challenge societal expectations as well as surpass obsolete models of criticism through the integration of their public personas into their, into their art practice, elevating it to a certain extent into a medium as such, equal to any of the other traditional forms of artistic expression. Harnessing Western culture's attraction and repulsion for the cult of personality, artists are able to use self-generated myths as a means of contesting the dominant and often ideologically rigid forms of cultural criticism and history. I'd like to now segue um, into a discussion of Andy Warhol. So um, I'd start with a quote of Warhol on the subject of fame. If I ever have to cast an acting role, this is Warhol speaking, I want the wrong person for the part. It's more satisfying to get someone who's perfectly wrong. Then you know you really got something. That was for, in the philosophy of Andy Warhol from A to B and back again. Andy Warhol wasn't merely famous, both in the artistic circles as well as in the, the mainstream. He changed the nature of fame, and his impact was not limited to the world of art and artists. Warhol founded his art practice on the careful choreography of his public persona. He harnessed the power of celebrity, his own, the celebrities he created, the culture's growing thirst for celebrity as such, elevating it to a different status. For Warhol, his persona was an artistic medium, no different from the more conventional forms that he used in his art, such as film, painting, sculpture, and photography. 
Despite our current facility to merge the figure of Warhol with today's entertainment-obsessed society, there's little interpretation of the relationship between Warhol's construction of his persona and, his direct, and its direct impact on his art. The campaign to isolate and dismiss the importance of Warhol's persona in terms of his overall artistic contribution is quite systematic in much academic writing. Scholarly publications such as October attempt to fix the persona problem by historicizing Warhol into two distinct periods. The early factory years, which would be roughly from 1960 to 1968, and the business art years, 1969 to 1987. For example, art historian and film theorist Annette Michelson has chosen the term pre-lapsarian to characterize th this first period. Her biblical allusion perfectly sums up the evil that, the supposed evil that Warhol engaged in the business art phase of his life, causing his expulsion from the Garden of Eden. After 1968, she writes, Warhol assumed the role of grand couturier who sells whose who signature sells or licenses perfumes. Warhol's business art found its apogee in the creation of a label that could be affixed. While the pre-1968 factory certainly flirted with celebrity and the mainstream vehicles of fame, it did so under critical auspices, at least in the, the point of view of Michelson. For her, the pre-lapsarian Warhol reflected the ills of mainstream culture through an irony-soaked parody. The shot fired from Valerie Solanus' gun in 1968, attempting to assassinate Warhol, signaled the beginning of the end of Warhol's critical period. It supposedly marked his decline. It is commonly held truth that this traumatic event soured Warhol, driving him more towards cynical modes of art making. This event also marked a dramatic shift away in the way Warhol consciously used his celebrity, making perhaps the emergence of public persona as a legitimate and autonomous artistic medium. At least on the surface, Warhol's life and, and art in the new factory carried on as before. He continued to make films, paintings, and sculptures, as well as had his hand in various other cultural enterprises. Yet, as the delegation of Warhol's artistic production slightly increased, Warhol made even more time for public appearances. During the 1970s and 1980s, he continued to travel around the world, documenting his globetrotting through his time capsules. In New York, his social life epitomized the fashion of the time and, and peaked with the decadence of such my mythical clubs such as Studio 54. Warhol behaved like any other star. His overactive social life was relentlessly photographed by the paparazzi, and he regularly appeared in the society and gossip pages. He cavorted with Michael Jackson, Bianca Jagger, Joan Collins, as well as countless other stars, royalty, and society women. The list of Warhol's companions captured on film was not only a barometer for who was hot in the 1970s and 80s, but it also reflected his Rolodex of celebrity clients for his booming portrait business. Working for the Zoli Modeling Agency, especially, uh, he was available for special bookings only, Warhol sold his celebrity to various companies for product endorsements in television and print, giving a sense of inevitability to his early pop appropriations of such banal products as Brillo scrubbing pads and Campbell soup cans. Whether he was modeling Levi's blue jeans, advertising TDK videotapes, LA Iwerks sunglasses, or even advertising the ill-fated Drexel Burnham Lambert Junk Bomb Company, or guest starring on a special episode of The Love Boat, these vulgar commercial activities were part of the logical common, uh, culmination of Warhol's trajectory. He writes, business art is the step that comes after art. I started as a commercial artist, and I want to finish as a business artist. After I did that thing called art, or whatever it's called, I want to be called an art businessman or a business artist. Warhol refused to differentiate between right and wrong appearances in the business art phase of his life. What counted was translating his persona into, the most extreme, into, into its most extreme commercial potential. While Warhol was trying to maximize the impact of his public persona in the spheres of art, popular culture, and the market, he insisted on highlighting his imperfections, his personal neuroses, and his claim to be nothingness himself. While this paradoxical coupling of extreme public exposure and a sense of invisibility might be chalked up to some manifestation of false modesty, 
as morally back bankrupt and as his indiscriminate activities seemed, it could also be attributed to the fulfillment of one of his crypto-critical philosophical max maxims. When he describes himself as putting his Warhol on, he, enum he, he enumerates what he saw in the mirror. He writes, nothing is missing, it's all there. The affectless gaze, the diffractive grace, the bored languor, the wasted pallor, the chic freakiness, the basically passive astonishment, the glamour rooted in despair. The public persona became one of the most effective vehicles to engage contemporary life. It might even be considered a conceptual oeuvre onto itself. I would like to argue that Warhol provides both a model and something that is unrepeatable, paradoxically. That this whole aspect of his career and what has been largely deemed, at least in academia, as being his worst phase, is a means of performing the system, as well as performing himself. I think that if we were to extrapolate from Warhol certain things that were part of this post-lapsarian period, the fact that he was occupied as much a role of the artist as he did as a magazine publisher, a gadfly, a compulsive shopper, a celebrity portraiti portraitist, and a wallflower in a subcultural milieu, as well as a model for hire, we can see that this impact is, uh, in fact, a, a great uh, importance today in the work of many artists, ranging, as I had said earlier, from Martin Kippenberger, Jeff Koons, and inversely, people such as Richard Prince, who may not play with uh, such entertainment society strategies overtly, but create an, a kind of opposite persona as a mystery man. I think I will probably stop here, because I could go on quite a bit about other artists, but I think Thanks, this Elizabeth. sets it up. Okay, uh, thank you to Pablo and to um, Patricia Sloan and Lucia Alvarez for organizing this event. Um, mi ensayo todavía no tiene título uh, y, y lo voy a leer en inglés. Um, in Jean Genet's play, a 1956 play, The Balcony, the chief of police despairingly asks two women in an exclusive brothel, Carmen and Irma, whether or not any of the customers have desired to play his role. I ask you, do I exist, inquires the chief of police. You do not, answers Irma. Uh, what, not yet, he exclaims frantically. Are there no simulations? Simulations, repeats Carmen. Idiot, yes, simulations of the chief of police, to which Irma responds, no, the time is not yet right, my dear. Your function has not yet been sufficiently recognized as worthy of becoming an image fantasy to console dreamers. Written half a century ago, Genet's drama concerns the complex relationship between fantasy, mimesis, role-playing, and masquerade. The playwright addresses how performance serves both to found and legitimate subject positions in society. Or to put it slightly differently, it's only when someone or something is represented or becomes a sign of itself that it achieves recognition and significance. By desiring that others simulate his role as chief of police, the actual chief of police seeks to affirm and buttress and aggrandize his identity. Genet's play is set at the turn of the century. Since then, of course, questions about the legitimacy of the role of policemen have taken many turns. However, fantasies continue to be play out, even, in the particular, even if the particular roles have, have changed. My presentation today will explore the recent proliferation of video works in which artists validate their particular practice by publicly identifying with an earlier artist and constructing a genealogy for their own work. For the purposes of brevity, I'll limit myself to discussing three specific video projects, though I want to emphasize that there are many others in which similar issues prevail. The video projects upon which I'll focus are Rene Green's Partially Buried of 1996, Christian Philip Mueller's Im Geschmack der Zeit of 2003, and Andrea Fraser's Kunst muss hangen of 2001. Questions that I want to grapple with include, what are the broader implications of these art historical and genealogical maneuvers? 
Are the lines between art and documentary reality entirely blurred or merely reconfigured in these projects? And what does the filial and genealogical association desired and indeed established by the younger artist do for both? Let me briefly describe these works for those who are not familiar with them. Partially Buried is a multi-layered project that summons several overlapping spheres of influence. The United States in the 1960s and 70s, the reception of Robert Smithson, African American culture, and contemporary critical theory. Initially, the video constituted one part of a much larger environment, which included photographs, magazines, records, recordings, and other supporting texts. But with the dismantling of the installation, the videotape component has come to be exhibited on its own as a work in its own right. Um, and could I, uh, el, video por, el video, por favor, sing the simulation of an historian. But before we proceed, it should also be emphasized that it's not just the role of a historian that's being represented. More specifically, it's, the, it's an art or architecture historian that Mueller and Green assume. By projecting themselves in double roles as both artists and as art historians, they inscribe themselves not only into their own artwork, but also into a certain genealogy of artistic practice. To return to Genet, it's the events of a revolution in the streets at the end of the play that transforms the chief of police from his present condition into a historical subject worthy of representation. Both Green and Mueller mimic or perform the role of art historian in order to produce a reading of history that's marked by difference and allows the spectator to see differently. The difference in Partially Buried is based in race and gender, the relationship of a contemporary African-American female artist to a historical narrative that's been primarily constructed as white and male. In the case of Poltzig, Mueller, through his videotape and presence, camps the architect, makes him campy, thus drawing attention to the heterosexual myth of the masculine disposition of the field of architecture. By representing through their own bodies the representation of a history, an excess is produced that creates a perception of incongruity. This incongruity in the form of their performative roles affirms and represents subjectivities whose specific differences from the unmarked, tacitly universal white heterosexual male uh, um, have been censored out. Theirs becomes a politics of highlighting the socially and historically compromised nature of knowledge and of making the invisible visible again. By performing the part of the historian, both artists emphasize the important role of the latter in constructing the canon and in determining who's included and who's not. Their appropriations and masquerades underscore the ideological underpinnings of any historical project or genealogy. History from this point of view is understood as a, con a constructed narrative rather than one that's inscribed in the order of things. The cultural context of the present in which the artist works is just as important to understand as the cultural and historical context in which the pre precursor artists that they're in dialogue with operated in. For it's the context of their own perspective in the present that determines their interpretations of the past. Now, and here we go for the third videotape. If the methodology of the two projects that I just discussed is similar, Andrea Fraser's videotape, Kunst muss hängen, uh, La obra debe colgarse, uh, pushes the strategy of role playing, mimicry, and masquerade to another level. The videotape features Fraser re performing a speech by the late German artist Martin Kippenberger. As Fraser explains in a recent statement appropriately entitled Performance Anxiety, Kippenberger was an important figure for her for a number of reasons. First, he had actually purchased several of her artworks, which didn't go without notice by German and indeed other European collectors. Secondly, and more importantly for our purposes here, was that Kippenberger had perfected the role of the self-loathing artist who hurls insults and vitriol at those in the institution of art who support his pathetic being and subject position. 
Many of his public speeches were excessive and, in Fraser's view, were extraordinary acts of self-objectification that were at once violent, pathetic, and grotesque. Kippenberger performed his position as an artist and embodied it at the very same time. So what happens when Fraser, an artist, performs a performance by another artist who is in turn performing the role of a pathetic artist? And where is the reality of this exchange located? Prior to attempting to untangle this slippery chain of representation, let me briefly describe Fraser's performance. For Kunstmusshangen, Fraser costumes herself so as to mimetically resemble Kippenberger. The latter's speech, which was similar to many other public speeches that Kippenberger made in the 1980s and 90s, was delivered to a public of art collectors, dealers, curators, critics, and others in the contemporary art world on the occasion of a formal dinner following a gallery opening in Austria in 1995. Fraser carefully studied a videotape documenting Kippenberger's intoxicated and highly obnoxious address and memorized and reproduced his words and gestures, inflections, intonations, and, and movements perfectly. This strategy of impersonation, in which Kippenberger's drunken mannerisms and vulgar disrespect of his art world audience and himself are meticulously represented, implies, at least in the context of an artwork, at once both affirmation and critique, suggesting that there's something going on here that is more than just an impersonation. By choosing to imitate Kippenberger at his best, or worst, depending on one's perspective, in other words, by imitating Kippenberger while he performs the role of the misogynist, homophobic, and xenophobic artist, expressing his disdain of dealers, collectors, and other art world patrons, Fraser signals her reverence for the legacy of the now dead artist. But at the same time, her appropriation of Kippenberger's persona raises the question of her particular relationship to this past model. Is her performance a stylistic confrontation, a contemporary reading that establishes difference at the heart of similarity, or an imitation that adds an, an exclamation point to the relevance of Kippenberger's speech today? Indeed, Fraser's mimicry of Kippenberger inevitably recalls strategies of appropriation developed by artists in, a previous, artists in a previous period, namely the late 70s and early 80s, typified by the re-photography of figures such as Sherry Levine and, and Louise Lawler. Indeed, just as Levine's work consisted of directly re-photographing from existing reproductions a series of photographs by several masters of photographic modernism and presenting the work as her own, Fraser directly re-performs Kippenberger's speech performed before an art public before yet another art public. From this perspective, Fraser's performance, Fraser's reperformance upsets, just as much as Levine's pictures do, ideologies of authorship, originality, and subjective expression on which the integrity of artworks and artists alike are presumed to, look to rest. And just as Levine's selection of stolen images was anything but arbitrary, always, as many others have now argued, the work of canonized and uh, male photographers, the particular performance Fraser chooses to re-perform is ideologically dense. The misogynist, homophobic, and xenoph xenophobic white male artist abjectly addressing his public. Thus, both Levine and Fraser subject what they appropriate to a de demystifying scrutiny enabled and mobilized by the very act of replacing them within quotation marks. And yet, there's something very different about taking a picture of another artist's work and assuming the persona and performing the subjectivity of another artist. More than a prank, an ironic gambit, and one that's mechanically produced at that, to perform somebody else's public identity is also performatively to constitute oneself by an act. And the sustained nature of the videotape, namely the fact that unlike taking a photograph or photographs, to, per to perform someone's identity within the context of a videotape is not a singular event, but a sustained production. The sustained nature of the videotape has a real effect on agency, especially since agency itself arises not from some choosing subject existing before the performance of identity, but rather from the self constituted by performance. 
Just as Kippenberger's identity is constructed through his public performance, so is Fraser's. Indeed, Fraser's painstaking restaging of Kippenberger's performance sutures her own personality so thoroughly with that of the performed subject that artist and role appear to merge in a seamless whole. Fraser's act of mimicry is so intense that it becomes difficult to distinguish the dancer from the dance. Unlike Mueller's or Green's performances, Fraser so fully incorporates Kippenberger, her mimicry or simulation comes so close to its referent that it produces an extreme anxiety, for it's no longer clear if there is difference between imposture or role and the real thing. In other words, is Fraser representing a past performance that is gender, cultural, and time-specific, time or is she articulating a present subject position of a more general condition in the new millennium, one that transcends gender and, shall we say, expands the notion of cultural and historical specificity? And perhaps this is what produces discomfort in the viewer, the inability to know for sure whether the condition that Kippenberger's speech articulates and with which it engages was culturally and historically specific and now has passed, or whether it's much more general and we're actually still experiencing it. That is to say, whether the scathing indictments against the art world and the realm of culture at large, articulated by Kippenberger, are still as resonant today as they were when they were made in Austria in the early 1990s. To sum up then, in the work of Green and Mueller, there's a distance between their present day subject positions as artists and the role of historian that they play. Although their view of history is dialogical, with an evident awareness of how historical narratives are invested with the values of the present, there still exists a separation between past and present, an underscore, as underscored by the separation between their presence as artists and their performance as historians. In the case of Fraser's Kunstmustangen, the distinction between past and present has been collapsed, parallel to the complete blurring between her identity and that of Kippenberger. Returning in conclusion to Genet's play then, it would seem that Kippenberger's self-hating diatribe directed at what he deems to be an utterly perverse art world is becoming a stance or a role that today is more resonant than ever. Like the chief of police in the balcony, who had to wait for an increase of social unrest for the pertinence of his role to become apparent, by perfectly impersonating and fusing her identity with that of Kippenberger, Fraser makes the point that the relevance and the significance of Kippenberger's abhorrent artistic persona has only increased as the years have gone by. Thank you. Um, thank you, the three of you, for your presentation. And uh, I, I have to say that I'm, I'm really happy to see how many different perspectives we have on a similar subject and the different uh, gist that each one of you took. Uh, I want to thank uh, Roger for having brought up uh, Graciela Carnevale's example, because we are uh, dealing with also Latin American examples, and I think it's very interesting to, to see things like her work is not that well known. And uh, it's, it's actually, a, in the, as we talk about the, the, the process of history and memory and recovering that, that history, that the, the history of performance art in Latin America is precisely one of those things that need to be recovered. Um, what, what, I was, what struck me from these three presentations was um, um, well, the different ways in which we, we can really analyze the, the relationship between the artist and, and the way they incorporate uh, history, whether it's um, the artist as uh, some sort of catalyst or to trigger and restore memories, as somehow you were describing, where they go to places they reenact or will recover uh, missing uh, links. To, um, uh, to Allison's description of the artist as some sort of character and performer, uh, self-aware performer in a certain history that exists, uh, and Warhol's uh, uh, self-awareness in that, how he played that role. And finally, what, what Alex is mentioned, mentioning of artists as historians, uh, whether it's from uh, uh, autobiography that becomes a collective biography, or uh, when it connects as and Jeff Fraser's uh, uh, role as becoming somehow of an art historian, as she's actually addressing uh, maybe a chapter of her history, if you want to see it that way. 
my my question is how do you what are, what are the challenges perhaps we, we can start by by saying this what are the challenges of uh, of writing uh, or uh, as you as curators as writers uh, uh, how do you actually can write about these artists in these new roles that they perform um, some of the issues that that sometimes are uh, when, when, the, when these artists are attacked sometimes in terms of taking on a historic a historian role or uh, an archaeologist role is that they are a, an amateur uh, professional and that they're just playing the role but not really uh, doing real history or real a real comment on that what are the challenges on, on these uh, new uh, new roles that these artists have casted themselves in as you write about them and you understand the work Um, take a shot. Uh, well, I um, <clears throat> let me save you. Um, <clears throat> uh, well, I, uh, I don't have to write about them. So, um, <clears throat> but I think what's um, the the um, the challenge is to, I mean, I think in terms of artistic methods is that, um, I mean, what shouldn't happen if, if artists are uh, dealing with historical subjects, I mean, with particular historical subjects, is that you get in that, um, that the past or a certain historical moment is um, substantialized or, or monumentalized. I mean, you have, a, you have an element of fetishization um, when, when, when artists are, um, are, are taking up, uh, let's say, singular moments in the past which seem to be more, um, more promising or more erratic. Than, than, a, than an impoverished presence. But on the other hand, I mean, what's so interesting uh, about some of those artists uh, we, um, we mentioned is that their, um, their approach towards, towards history um, functions in fact as a kind of de-essentializing I mean of what had happened so the artist is a kind of is a figure who is very important in in terms of what might be called self-education um, approaching the past and trying to to relate his or her own presence in in relation to that passed, and I think that this notion of education, also in terms of exhibition making, is is very um, very important. Let me just say the um, the artists, as when they use theory, for instance, um, an artist has a certain liberty. Um, that a philosopher doesn't say. A philo an artist can say certain things about philosophical texts uh, and, and juxtapose elements of philosophical texts that a scholar cannot. There's a, there's a, there is a distinction there. The artist has the freedom um, because of the creative uh, uh, a dimension that, we, that the society grants the artist to juxtapose things and to say things, to draw conclusions uh, that uh, a philosopher would be chased out of uh, uh, academia for doing. Um, and I think that it's similar with history and with the artist's uh, relationship to history. Um, an artist has uh, um, more, uh, uh, has the, the ability to be more playful with history uh, um, and um, in a way that a scholar would not necessarily, uh, um, a kind of liberty that a scholar would not necessarily have. Um, however, I think that in that playfulness, and this is what is so intriguing about artworks in general, uh, certain insights are produced nonetheless. And uh, uh, in, the, in the case of uh, in the case that we've been we've been talking about here, uh, um, it's it's you know this uh, the case that I was talking about at least it's this the the. Uh, 
the, the accenting of the personal accenting of the double poles. I mean, accenting the personal dimension uh, of the historical study, um, and basically. Uh, um, uh, noting or emphasizing how uh, much a historical study is mediated by the present and, and the role of the present and the role even of the subjective dimension of the, of the, the person carrying out the study uh, in what they study and in what they, they analyze. It's nothing that we don't already know, but they're accenting it. There's a certain uh, uh, accenting to the process and therefore uh, um, basically producing the general insight uh, that uh, um, to understand a historical historical study, uh, uh, one needs to factor into the equation, the contextual and even the subjective dimension uh, uh, and the subjective particulars of the person who's, who's doing the study itself. I, I guess I would like to <clears throat> just add that one of the reasons why I've been interested in this question of artistic persona and trying to make an argument that in the work of different artists like Warhol or Kippenberger that it's indisos one cannot understand their practice without assimilating an understanding of how that, pers that persona in is a conceptual part or a, of the overall body of work is that not only does it in a very, not only does it reflect certain, uh, in, in very subtle ways, reflections about society, the nature of society, the, the way artists insert themselves into popular culture, but the artists also, the antagonism perhaps comes from the fact that the artist challenges many of the, the sets of values that have been traditionally projected on artists, like what they should do, what, what types of criticism that, or any kind of overt criticism that they should be um, offering in their, both their behavior and in the actual content of their work. So when I was speaking about Warhol and the way that uh, it's very easy to purge out a certain part of Warhol as being illegitimate, frivolous, uh, same with Kippenberger for many years, uh, his drunken antics, many of the things that Alex was speaking about were often seen as detracting from or artificially inflating his work, but I think it's also part of this, this is an antagonism that is very important because it, it's, a, it's a means of reflecting back on ourselves, why do we want artists to show us the right way? Why do we, why as a society have we often looked to artists to be the ones to denounce uh, social problems, political problems? Can artists make criticisms without using a language of opposition, a, a, a language of, or even a certain visual language of austerity. I mean, can, can artists have that kind of agency? So that's why I, I have been interested not only in the actual process of constructing persona and trying to elevate it into something beyond uh, anecdote, but also um, understand how that, let's say, engages certain hegemonic ideas within art history and the reception of artists' roles. Can I, can I? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, no? Go ahead, whoever wants first. Go. I have two questions to my colleague. Um, I have one question to Alison. Why don't you <coughs> uh, mention any female artist? Is this, that was my question. Is this accident? Well, is this accident? <laughs> or no? I, I'm just wondering if this is a particular. You are talking about the artist, but if if, if this is a particular case of male hysteria, maybe, uh, which uh, which um, which you are yeah. dealing with, because that could also be interested, interesting to look at it in um, in gender terms. And my question to Alex is, um, uh, is it accidental that in all of your examples the figure of the artist figures quite prominently or do you also know of any examples of such a kind of archaeology where you, where you don't have this kind of narcissistic presence? To answer your question, I, I don't think that it's necessarily... My, my interest is not... I spoke mainly about two examples which are basically... One is a bad boy, Martin Kippenberger, the other, Warhol, who certainly, in terms of societal norms, is not uh, you know, a stand-up, red-blooded, uh, heterosexual male. There are women artists who do use their own persona. I mean, I, I think that the problem is, is that there's a bit of a, 
in, in the arguments that I've been trying to sketch out, there's a difference between, for me, artists who construct persona and then another branch of artists who, let's, say, let's just call them like life artists of practices that emerged in the 70s where an artist's life in a mostly documentary mode becomes a vehicle for their practice. Someone like Sophie Kahl, someone like um, Hannah Wilke, Eleanor Anton. But I don't think that that is exactly the same thing because they they are not asserting themselves into let's say a mainstream uh, or a pop culture uh, context. I think that someone like Tracy Emin, for example, maybe bridges the gap because she's somewhere in between uh, this life artist documenting her own experiences and a kind of self exploitation, which is very much part of uh, today's popular culture with the advent of all kinds of things like reality shows and all of this. Um, you know, I, I don't know if that aptly answers your question, but I think that it's, you know, in a context like this, it's a very condensed moment, so it's not an exclusive domain of male artists, although obviously, um, you know, men have frequently been more effective in asserting themselves in certain types of media and certain types of, uh, you know, dramatic presence. And as for the question of hysteria, I mean, that's, those models, are, intellectual models, are not things that I'm particularly invested in, so I can't really answer that question. But isn't it also that men, um are allowed to get away with it more than women are. I mean, think of Linda Benglis's uh, intervention where she does that to self-promote and, you know, uh, half the board of uh, our forum quit. And, and, and formed October, actually. By the way. Yeah, well, exactly. So there's this just out, outraged by a woman doing this, whereas Robert Morris could do it and it was fine. Right? I mean, it, her dialogue was with Robert Morris there. Yeah. Robert Morris's own self-promotion it was that was fine. The the male, you know, quasi fascistic artist dressed up in, you know, in in, in Nazi garb, um, but uh, that, so that was okay. But when the woman, so it, but I don't I mean, think I there's think, any a priori situation where women can't access that that vehicle of expression. I mean, well, it's like in academia. You know, I find it in in the university system, at least in the U.S. If if a male is aggressive, you know, it's like they're assertive. They're really doing things. They're pushing it. If a woman's aggressive. If she's a bitch. Well, yeah, but <laughs> right, and it's like you know, forget her. But it, it's, as it's a woman, as a woman writing, I mean, does that mean that I should abandon any kind of you know endorsement or interest into no, male bravado not. in trying to really get down to what it means? You know, so I, I think that that's no, also another interesting position. Well, the, I mean, the other question is whether really we're, we're talking about the artists as if they are in completely in control of the situation, but the reality is that each one of these artists are also the subject of this entire market and this whole mythology that the art world creates around them. And uh, I mean, we are really, in the art world, we're really obsessed with this idea of the artist as something elevated or something that we mythologize. And I mean, are, are really artists that much in, able to manipulate that, the kind of images that eventually our history casts upon them? Let me get back to answering question. Yes, we're going to take a question. Do you want me to answer now or the type later? I don't care. Let's take it from the floor. I would like okay. to know it at some point. Uh, 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 here, it's a uh, question. Here comes trouble. Thank you. Those were wonderful presentations. Um, I have questions, many questions, too many questions. Um, just to start uh, with Mr. Albero, uh, just a question about uh, Fraser's presentation. You said it was a perfect impersonation. It's quite clear that she's a woman. Her hair is different, okay? Uh, this, I think, is an important signal, female artist appropriating a male artist. Uh, secondly, I just a question about this. What strikes me in all these cases uh, is you have uh, younger artists uh, going after name brand artists. So you have identification. She's identifying with Kippenberger, uh, who is very successful. He's at this dinner. Uh, Postsick is a well-known architect, whatever you think of his work. Smithson, one of the new greats, etc. So uh, you have piggybacking, I would say, of the, uh, of the less known on the known. I just wonder what you, what you think of that, and maybe that's some art world strategy. I suggest that part of the whole Kippenberger bit, uh, his act is to sort of uh, 
pat the donkey on the nose, uh, pay attention to me, I'm addressing to an audience. Uh, so there's an act there. Uh, that question. Then in relation to Allison's uh, remark, uh, hey, Andy Warhol is an American success story. He made big bucks, he made money. Uh, money is as American as apple pie. Okay, and uh, I suggest to you the cliche of the American is, uh, I don't know where you've got this, the uh, red-blooded male. Uh, the American is Orville Wright, uh, Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, a tinkerer, a sort of guy who says, as Henry Ford said, it's history is bunk, I can just do it, okay? You can have all your fantasies. I suggest that that's a cliche of the American that makes no sense. Uh, in relation to a Warhol not being American, I don't know if you know less, uh, an, being outside of the mainstream because he's gay, uh, I remind you of uh, Leslie Fiedler's famous essay, Come to the Raft with Me, Huck Honey, uh, about Huck, Huck, Huckleberry Finn's homosexuality, homosexual inclinations. Uh, then in relation to Mr. Berger, a little question for you too, you have to forgive me. Uh, uh, Should we take it one why, time? Yeah, why is transparency uh, uh, superficial? I suggest that transparency hides more than it reveals Deals, really, that's the whole whole point of, of the transfer is to show it all. It's something like what Marcuse called repressive desublimation. You show it all, but there's no affect. There's nothing connected to it. So, a question for everybody. So, who wants to uh, respond? I don't want it. I thought I'd participate. Do you want to go first? Or? No. In that order. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. I really, I'm not quite sure how to answer your question, but essentially, I'm not interested. I, what you bring up as a cliche, I think that Warhol was often playing with all of the cliches that he embodied and represented. And unfortunately, because of the format of a lecture like this, things become very schematic. So it's not possible to. It's often very difficult to transgress whatever cliches that you, you speak about that you've aptly brought up. Um, I think, and I'm not really sure the gist of, uh, to drive to the heart of your question, because it was... The question is Warhol is an all-American success story. Yes. He's not an outsider, he's not a transgressor. He's into the system, but he and he knew how to use the system. But I think that, um, if I can just backtrack, one of the reasons why I bring up Warhol is that, yes, his main, the mainstream understanding of Warhol is that he is a success story, despite the fact that he was gay, that he was all of these things that are not red-blooded Republican-American ideals. Nonetheless, what I was the point I was trying to make is that if you, his career in terms of academia and in terms of any kind of criticality that has been assigned to his work and his any kind of critical reflection of American society has been neatly truncated. That we look at Warhol, the beginning of Warhol's career, the kind of classical early factory years as being the critical part and all of these other ancillary activities that he did, his compulsive shopping, his uh, publishing interview magazine, his doing ads, this breaks with what at least academia or a certain ideal of the artist has been built within uh, you know, a certain consensus of art history. And that's why I was trying to bring up Warhol as one of the primary models. But we could also talk about other artists, such as Picabia, or we could talk about Dali, who do similar things in terms of societal expectation and the kind of dabbling that have been, for a long time, completely purged from art history, or at least you know, embarrassingly dealt with in footnotes, as opposed to trying to integrate that into an understanding of their overall intentionality and their contribution to culture at large. I don't uh, want to be labor. I just want to say one thing. Just one thing. I don't know if you've ever heard of the log cabin Republicans. They are a very large homosexual Republican group. Just to let you know, there are homosexuals oh, in the I'm Republican not. Party. <laughs> um, Quauhtémoc, you had a question that we want to hear. Um, I enjoyed a lot uh, Alvaro's presentation. I really find it very stimulating. What, everything you said. Okay. You left me wondering with, with your emphasis on mimicry particularly in relation to, to the last piece by Andrea Fraser, because I felt that there's a tension between the pieces where she actually works uh, mimicking um, the discourse of institutions like the, the intervention in, insight, 
and this piece. And somehow I was wondering if you probably could develop a little bit on that. I, I thought for a moment that the question of reenactment probably could into, in, into place, and, and probably there would be a, 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 a possibility of, of working out some, some sort of differentiation on the way she's working different pieces, especially also in relation to the, the piece about the revolutionary peasant that she did uh, uh, some years ago as well. Um, I could. You're asking me to talk about a paper I haven't that I'm, I haven't written, but it's fine because it's something I am working on. Um, the direction I'm going with with this idea of mimicry is uh, towards cannibalism. Um, I will argue that Fraser. It's anthropophagia. Uh, Fraser consumes Kippenberger, uh, uh, completely overtakes him. Uh, you know the gender thing. Um, yeah, yes, she, she's clearly female, but she's playing him. I mean, this is uh, she's acting uh, 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 Kippenberger as as carefully as possible for somebody who doesn't speak German to learn this particular speech meticulously is is a, an accomplishment. It took six months or so, um, and so. The, it's, it's about, not just about identification then, it's about over-identification and where over-identification goes. That, that's what I'm mostly interested in. Uh, um, it's something that uh, uh, um, I've um, also um, working uh, um, with uh, a, a Slovenian musical group. Um, what's the name of um, Kai. Not not NSK the um, Leibach yeah with it's a similar similar process to what to Leibach where you don't know what's going on I mean Leibach does this performance you don't know if they're fascists they're totalitarians or if they're punk rockers or uh, artists you, you just you don't know and it fools you it doesn't fool you it throws everything into confusion that's what I'm, I I think is going on here she you don't know if she, if she's actually saying this stuff and meaning it or not meaning it and that produces the anxiety that so that's where I'm going with that I, I hope that kind of half answered uh, uh, the, the question um, yeah I think that's all awesome. you, you want to also answer that I, to, we can we can answer that another time I, I just want to ask you a quick question about this cannibalism because I think it's a really interesting uh, way of um, nominating what she's doing but just hypothetically, do you think that her that this can the anxiety that would be produced would be more powerful if it was an ongoing performance, which is to say that this is very much framed as an artwork. And Kip, the power of Kippenberger's own persona was that it was completely impossible to separate. Uh, there were no boundaries in terms of his outrageous behavior, the war, what manifested itself in the actual work. Um, the legends, the stories that continue to become, you know, and that grow, that snowball with time. So what I'm, I mean, it's just a, a kind of off-the-cuff question about whether or not um, the effectiveness or the, the reach of that, of that cannibalism would it, because to me it's, it still seems to be very much within a theatrical framework. It's framed very much as an artwork. It's presented as a videotape. And it's not like Andrea Fraser has, you know, gone around, um, as far as I know, becoming an outrageous alcoholic and um, Wow, she's misogynist. Pretty, pretty outrageous in some way. But, but, yeah. but, and also, uh, I mean, just one thing. She, I remember reading in that same piece that you quoted that it's quite significant that she turned to Kippenberger because for such a long time she was almost in an oppositional camp in terms of mm -hmm. how she was positioned mm -hmm. as, you know, the reception of her work Mm -hmm. as a, a kind of, you know, counter-cultural, counter... -cultural, counter... I, the only thing I could say is, yes, perhaps it would be more effective if she always walked around acting Kippenberger. Mm. But she doesn't. I mean, she, I think the point's been made in the in the 35-minute uh, uh, video tape, mm -hmm. which is a loop. I mean, if you go into, a, if you see it in a museum, it, it she is always walking around because it loops back to the beginning, and you know, she she becomes Kippenberger. But yeah, it's uh, it's limited in that in mm. real life she does other. She goes shopping as Andrea Fraser. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> um, otra pregunta. 
about the mic, the why the mic comes. I, I guess I, it also connects. What you're saying also connects with uh, certain artists who take older performances, like this, this series called uh, Fresh Akanchi, that Mike Kelly uh, and uh, Paul McCarthy put that they eroticize uh, old Akanchi performances. And I mean, it's a way also for an artist to acknowledge the, the own, well, like, give an homage, but also like their own personal opinion on the piece. Or I mean, I don't know if it's connected in any no, way. No, it's, it's definitely connected. No, but hold it, but Akanchi, of course, was already eroticized. I mean, they just re-eroticized yeah, it. Yes, way. Okay. yeah. <laughs> um, yes, uh, thank you for the three pre presentations that very nicely sort of clicked together, yet uh, left me uh, thinking, and uh, I'm probably not, not going to be very articulate here, but I resist uh, everything that's been said <laughs> somehow. There was a one point I would like to make, is, and, and it's especially clear to my mind regarding Warhol. Um, what I think I resist, even though I agree with Alison, I agree totally with your salvaging the post-68 Warhol from um, what the academics and the October people have done to him. That's understood. But wh where I have problems is that you seem to uh, to go along with a widespread idea, which was also very much present in Alex's paper, that uh, identity is a construct that you can manipulate identity, that you can construct a persona. And I think this is, it's either theoretically impossible or it supposes another notion of subjectivity, like behind the one, behind the subject that is a sheer construction, a symbolic construction, there must hide another subject who is the constructor of that construction, even though maybe that subject, given, given the present day theories that circulate, conceives of him or herself as a construction of society, of the unconscious, of social struggle, of you name it. Uh, it doesn't, it's, it still sort of postulates another homunculus inside the, the homo. This theoretically, in terms of psychological theory, for example, poses a problem to me. Now, now if we look at it aesthetically, if we look at it uh, from, from the vantage point of art, uh, my conviction is that Warhol's persona is not at all a persona. That is, that is the authentic Warhol. What, what is so moving with Warhol is that, and so enlightening actually, to the point where, where you can, you, you, I would be willing to make Warhol into a great uh, theorist of modern, of, uh, yeah, of late modern uh, subjectivity or psychology. But it is clear that Warhol doesn't master his own persona. On the contrary, uh, the, the um, uh, yeah, well, Andrea Fraser seems to want to master her. It's interesting that she wants to ca cannibalize uh, Kippenberger, who is perhaps the only artist who manages the strategy, you will not eat me. Uh, he managed to do that. He managed to, he had to go to extreme uh, uh, fake violence, but staged violence, to be able to tell the whole system that he loathed indeed, you will not eat me. So it's interesting that Andrea Fraser would precisely cope, try to cope with, uh, with that, with that, try to cannibalize, try to, to, try to eat him. But back to Warhol. Uh, for whom I have immense admiration as an artist. Um, it is clear that when Warhol says, um, look at the surface of my films, there's nothing behind it. You have to take it literally. And then you end up, you, you, what, what you end up with is a sort of new theory of the self. Instead of having, you know, what, Deep inside me, that's, that's the, the, the metaphor that everybody uses when describing the self, deep inside me. There is no depth, there is surface in the case of Warhol. And what if we were to think of subjectivity as a surface? What if we, we, were, to, we were to take the, the, the word superficial to mean a very large surface? 
instead of superficial meaning a lack of depth. I mean, our metaphors are laden with prejudices of all sorts. So, but this leads me, my point is that I, Warhol developed this persona indeed, it can be said to be a persona, but it was for him a survival strategy, absolutely necessary, to the point where this persona escapes him, of course, and he is, uh, I mean, what you said about him looking at, at, at the mirror and saying at the end of the list, well, I correspond exactly to, to the definition that you know, that's in the scrapbook, that's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it uh, is in fact a v very moving testimony to the fact that Warhol did not control his persona. Um, that is the point that I want to make. Oh, thanks, Siri. Uh, esta va a ser la última respuesta, puesto que tenemos que seguir a la, al siguiente. Yeah, uh, let, let me just answer what pertains to me here. Uh, I, I'll leave aside the issue of, of Andrea Fraser, but I, I think clearly we disagree about the, the, um, about, uh, the way that identity functions. I do maintain that identity is a construct. Um, I think that what was interesting when you're saying that it implies that there is another subject that's a constructor of that, uh, construction, and you said that it's a he or a she. I, I, I think that's where you completely lose me because it isn't a he or a she. It's a context. It's a historical context. It, there, it's institutions, and there is a psychoanalytic dimension. Undoubtedly, it's it's complex, but it's not one person. It's not he or she. That that is a complete misunderstanding. If you, if that's uh, 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 of what I was saying, it's, it's it's much more complex than one person deciding who is doing the constructing. Uh, Okay. I, uh, just very briefly, I didn't I, try to. Sorry, just. Uh, I didn't yeah. try to oversimplify it. I said it's a construct. It can be a social construct. You, you're the product of oh, you your time. Or she. The product of your. Yeah. What do you mean, he or she? You said there, it implies that there is a constructor, and he and she, he or she is uh, doing the constructing. Uh, the, the, well, there is a certain there's a certain Andrea Fraser who constructs another Andrea Fraser. There's a certain person, the artists. Let's put it in very empirical way. There's a certain Andrew Fraser who constructs a persona who enacts Kippenberger in a performance. And uh, anyway, we're out of time. Uh, is is the question who's the real Andrew Fraser irrelevant? I or, wasn't or un uninteresting, maybe. That, you're shifting the question. I mean, I was, I was answering the issue about <clears throat> identity and how identity functions. I, I understood you saying that you didn't agree with my proposal that identity is a construct, largely. Well, I think it, it, indeed I would take issue with that. I, that's what I that was is, answering. That is a uh, wide spread quite apart belief the these days, but I don't buy that. No? Okay. Um, Just very briefly, I, I would largely agree with what you say about Warhol, that in a way it is a little bit. I, the, the use of the term persona in relationship to Warhol is perhaps just a ploy to rescue him from his the general reception, as you mentioned, and that I also would concur that he was not a master of persona, and that there is a lot of uh, deeply touching. That it wasn't all cynicism and surface, which is often uh, attributed to Warhol. Likewise with Kippenberger, I don't think that Kippenberger uh, turned himself on and off in that sense of persona, but I. I do think that somehow because there is not a lot of uh, writing about this question of trying to deal with persona and that generally when you start to learn art history you're taught to completely or to as much as possible do away with anything that has to do with autobiography that has to do with the extracurricular outside of the autonomous artistic practice that's why that term persona becomes useful in this discussion but we could speak much more about this later, I think. Yeah, we'll continue talking about the subject in the next panel as well. Uh, thank you all for, for being part of this. <clears throat> Muchas gracias. No vamos a hacer una pausa. Vamos a, a continuar directamente con la conversación con Hans Hacke. Por, por favor, no se vayan, porque se la van a perder.